You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. A Federal Judicial Center program. Bankruptcy Law Update. And now, here is our moderator, Vice Dean Lawrence Poneroff of Tulane University Law School. Hello and welcome to the first in a new series of Bankruptcy Law Update programs produced by the Federal Judicial Center here in Washington, D.C. The purpose of this and future programs in the series is going to be to look at the latest and what we think will be the most important developments in bankruptcy law. To do that, each time we'll gather a distinguished panel of judges and academics to provide their insights and analysis on this constantly changing area of practice. To prove my point, let me introduce today's panel, names and faces I'm sure will be familiar to all of you. We have Judge William Houston Brown from the Western District of Tennessee, Professor David Epstein from the University of Alabama School of Law, Professor Bruce Markell from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas Law School, Judge Elizabeth Paris from the District of Oregon, and Judge Eugene Weedoff from the Northern District of Illinois. Thank you all for being here. Also joining us later in the second part of the program will be Joseph Rubin from Congressman George Gikas's office. Mr. Rubin, of course, will be talking about the bankruptcy reform bill that will be developed by the House Senate Conference Committee, soon to be named. But let's begin our discussion today by looking at another question, a Chapter 13 question, specifically the question of the post-confirmation Chapter 13 estate. Um, Judge Brown, there seems to be considerable disagreement in the case law and a lot of variation from practice to practice. Um, in uh, the districts about whether or not the estate continues after confirmation or not. Uh, courts have worked very hard to try to harmonize um, the seemingly inconsistent provisions of 1306 and 1327B. Um, how does this issue arise and what are some of its implications? There certainly are differences in the way the courts look at this and it, it typically arises in, in this type of situation. The debtor has gotten to a confirmed Chapter 13 plan and is making the plan payments as provided, but for whatever reason incurs some post-confirmation debt, often for taxes or perhaps even other debt, uh, typically without any notice to anyone or without any permission or any inclusion of that debt in, in a modified plan. And of course then the post-confirmation creditor wants to collect if the debtor stumbles and doesn't make payments on that post-confirmation debt, there's some execution, garnishment, or some other uh, effort to collect, which may certainly impede the, uh, the debtor's ability to continue making the plan payments. And so the debtor may come back to court saying there's a violation of the automatic stay, uh, there is some other problem that the creditor is creating with uh, the completion of the plan payments, and the, the court's now faced with the issue of is there a bankruptcy estate that continued after confirmation? Is the automatic stay violated in any way? And basically the courts have taken views of, some courts look at it as that the estate has been terminated in fact with confirmation. There is no property in the estate. In fact, some courts say there is no estate uh, after that point. And other, in, I'm sorry, but in fact 1327B does say that unless your order provides otherwise, the property does revest in that's, the debtor. That's the, 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 the thing that those courts typically hang upon is that 1327 says that unless the plan or the order of confirmation provides otherwise, the property vests back in the debtor upon confirmation. Other courts that, that say no, the estate continues to be preserved in some form or amount look at the 1306 saying that no, the uh, property of the bankruptcy estate is expanded in Chapter 13 from the typical 541 definition to include assets, in earnings, property that the debtor acquires after confirmation. And uh, Gene Weedoff, for example, in his Fisher opinion, uh, 
that is often cited as one of the leading cases of the case of the estate preservation approach uh, says that very thing. Then, of course, that case got uh, was appealed, and on the appeal, the district court uh, in Fisher took the approach that is sometimes called the middle ground approach or the estate transformation approach, saying that, well, there's some estate that continues, but it, it partially terminated by vesting in the debtor, but it was replenished or added to or created again uh, with earnings that came into play after confirmation. If we take the estate termination view, which apparently several districts uh, do, what happens, as is not uncommon as you well know in Chapter 13, if the plan later fails and the debtor converts to a Chapter 7? That, that is obviously one of the concerns that uh, many courts have dealt with is 348 was amended uh, in the 94 Code to add 348, 348F that says that if the estate is, if the debtor converts from 13 to 7 uh, after confirmation, uh, typically, if there are no bad faith issues, then the estate that was in existence at the time of the filing of the case is the estate that in the converted case. But if the uh, debtor converts in bad faith under 348F, the estate it consists of the property at the time of the conversion. So if there is no estate that continues after confirmation, how can 348F have any effect? And that's one of the things that that Gene Weedoff pointed out and other courts have pointed out. Gene, of course, talked about the interesting two definitions that can be given to the word vesting. Vesting may mean, uh, certainly, putting ownership title back in the debtor. So if you look at the estate termination approach, that's probably what you say vesting means. On the other hand, vesting can also mean, as Gene pointed out, simply fixing the debtor's rights in the property to use it. Uh, we also know that uh, even wh whatever approach you take, that the debtor remains in possession of almost all property in the Chapter 13 situations. In fact, it's unusual for the debtor not to remain in possession. And so that's really what vesting may mean for the estate preservation courts or, or even those middle ground courts is that the debtor is simply getting total use of the property but for the benefit of creditors uh, to make certain the plan is, is carried out. Yeah, we know that meaning of vesting from retirement accounts or re rights under a retirement plan vesting. You had interest before, you have interest after, it's just it became fixed in some way. Right, that, that's correct. Well, do you think this has implications for Chapter 11, which has the identical language in 1129B uh, or 1141B? There is the identical language in Chapter 11 that unless the plan provides otherwise, the property vests in the debtor. But a key difference, of course, in 11 and 13 is that in 11, the debtor is getting a discharge upon confirmation. In 13, the debtor is not receiving a discharge until completion of the plan payments. And, and again, we have a post-confirmation modification issue in Chapter 13. If there's no estate, how can the debtor, if there is a modification of that confirmed plan, then, then how do you look at the best interest of creditors to see if in the modified plan the creditors are being treated as well as they would be in a Chapter 7 liquidation if there's no estate? But the proponents of the estate termination often in the cases raise a policy argument which is that revesting in, in the, the sense of all rights in the property back in the debtor uh, facilitates the ability of the debtor to obtain new credit and that's uh, helpful toward the uh, ultimate financial uh, rehabilitation of, of the debtor. It is clearly one of the policy arguments that courts for that estate termination approach adopt. Some of us may wonder, is that a real benefit? Should we be encouraging debtors in Chapter 13 to incur post-confirmation debt. Now, certainly they may need to in many situations, but we, those of us on the bench, obviously often see debtors incur post-confirmation debt without any permission from the court or the Chapter 13 trustee that was unnecessary debt and gets them into real trouble. So sure, maybe the debtor needs to incur some post-confirmation debt, but is that a strong enough argument to say we need the debtor to be incur, able to incur that kind of debt when, in fact, any debt after confirmation is going to impair the debtor's ability, if she is on a very tight budget, uh, 
as most 13 debtors are, right. to pay not only plan payments but that post-confirmation debt. Bill, can we avoid those kinds of policy questions and even avoid the, the hard questions of interpretation of, of 1327B uh, simply by plan provisions or provisions in, in, in the confirmation order? Is this a problem? Uh, that can, in essence, go away uh, through creative judging or creative lawyering? It can, indeed. In fact, even those courts that adopt the estate termination approach recognize, of course, that the code says, unless the plan or the order of confirmation provides otherwise property revest in the debtor. And so many courts, the high volume Chapter 13 courts especially, may have put into their confirmation orders, notwithstanding what a plan provision may be. Right. I think Gene's order says, even if the plan provides otherwise, your order says in confirmation the property does not vest in the debtor until what point? Uh, I mean, well, until the case ends or is converted or dismissed, whichever comes first. And that's basically the 1306 language. You know, I'm in this peculiar situation of having the opinion you talked about, Bill, being reversed and then having a binding Seventh Circuit there's case. A, there's a problematic Seventh Circuit case right. that you have to wrestle with. In, as far as I know, it's only been adopted by the Seventh Circuit up to this point. Right. It's a case called In Ray Heath. It's in Bill's outline, and it uh, basically tells me that all that's in the estate after confirmation is what's necessary for the performance of the plan. And of course, you have to make a determination as to what's necessary, but it's not the property the debtor had before. So because of the practical problems we talked about, you know, the desire to have the debtor uh, able to come to court when there's a problem post-petition. We put in all of uh, my confirmation orders, notwithstanding any provision of the plan to the contrary, all property of the estate, as specified by 11 U.S.C. sections 541 and 1306, shall continue to be property of the estate following confirmation. And that seems to work, take care of the problem. In, in my district, I regularly hear objections if the debtor wants to have the property remain property of the estate. I hear them from the trustee who's concerned about continuing to have some ownership interest in that property. And I hear them from the state who's concerned about collecting post-petition support and post-petition taxes and does not want to be slowed down by having to stop by the bankruptcy court on the way. Do you have any comments on those concerns? I do. And you know, I've heard them from my own trustees, but I have to say that I disagree with the trustees. I don't believe that in a Chapter 13 case, the trustee ever takes responsibility for the property of the estate. The debtor is said to be in possession of property of the estate. The trustee can't deal with it. And what's more, if there were a problem in this way, if the trustee really was responsible for making sure the estate property was insured, the trustee would have that responsibility at least from the filing of the case until the time of confirmation, which could be a period of months. I don't think trustees are going to assume that kind of responsibility pre confirmation and they shouldn't have that uh, responsibility post confirmation the estate is in the responsibility of the debtor i believe both before and, and after confirmation the other problem of post petition creditors being able to get easy access to the debtor's estate is precisely why i think we need to have the estate continue if someone like the uh, creditor in my Fisher case, the city of Chicago wanting to collect parking tickets, can take the debtor's car, tow it away, crush it, and dispose of it without ever letting the debtor or the bankruptcy court know anything about that, the possibility of completing a Chapter 13 plan can be greatly diminished. On the other hand, if they come into court and ask for relief from stay, there's the possibility of having their post-petition claim added to the plan or making some arrangement that they'd be paid after uh, the plan is completed and provide adequate protection in the meantime. So there are ways that the claim can be dealt with while keeping the Chapter 13 going for everybody's benefit. Except that in that case, Gene, aren't you you're treating m your paradigm of post-confirmation creditor as the voluntary creditor. What about the involuntary creditor like a tort claimant if there's no insurance? Or even in your, in your Fisher case, uh, you drop an interesting footnote with respect to the police powers. I mean, uh, the city of Chicago had said, uh, you know, we have the, the ability to crush cars for non-payment because this is, this is pursuant to our police power. So don't, I mean, don't those kind of justifications um, become a little bit suspect when you start looking at the whole universe? Because if you have a plan that goes for three or five years, aren't you really making some distinctions that don't seem supported by the current law between kind of post-confirmation creditors and everyone who was pre-petition? Well, the ultimate question is should this be decided in the context of the bankruptcy case or should that post-petition creditor have an unhindered right to take off after property of the debtor? 
And my thought is that whatever problems of the sort you raise are, they can best be dealt with in the context of the bankruptcy case. We make a determination that the police power is being exercised, well, then, of course, that can go ahead. If we make a pr uh, determination that the post-petition creditor won't be adequately protected, we can grant relief from the stay. But there are other things that can be done that can let the Chapter 13 case go forward, and I think the, the system works better if we have the estate continue. Can we go back to the replenishment approach that was imposed initially, I guess, by Judge Aspen on the appeal of your case, right. Gene, and there's a Massachusetts case bill that you mentioned in your materials, Rangel, right. Rangel. Uh, I believe. How does the replenishment approach differ from the estate continues approach, or is it just a rhetorical device to try it, to it, harmonize it, it, There the is statute. a distinction. It's trying to harmonize. I mean, the, the, those courts would say they have, in fact, harmonized 1306 and 1327 by saying, Yes, we recognize that the property vested, revested in the debtor at confirmation, and the estate may have terminated at that point, but it's renewed. All as, the as, as the debtor earns uh, income or acquires other property after confirmation, the estate is recreated. Now, the problem with that, of course, is, uh, and then some courts say, and it's only what is necessary, uh, the only thing that becomes property of the post-confirmation estate is what is necessary to fund the plan. Well, the problem is we're talking about money, and, and the debtors own a fixed income typically. How do we know which part of that income is necessary for the estate, which part's necessary for ongoing living expenses, and if we just freely allow creditors to get to the non-plan payment portion of that income, aren't we still, in fact, impeding the debtor's ability to, to successfully complete the plan? A and it becomes very arbitrary perhaps to figure out what in a case-by-case -case basis is necessary and what is not necessary. So even under that approach, the court's going to be involved in these questions, and why not simply uh, adopt Gene's approach that the estate is preserved and we'll deal with these issues. Do, do you feel like, Gene, one criticism may be that the courts will be flooded with post-confirmation determination? Well, practical experience teaches the contrary, because as I said, I've been putting the provisions we talked about in my orders for the last couple of years, and I have not been flooded, in fact, hardly touched by any of these complaints. It, it, uh, one other thing, though, I'd like to point out, it's not just protecting the debtor from post-confirmation uh, creditors. It's also protecting all of the pre-confirmation creditors from the debtor's action in disposing of property of the estate. If all the property the debtor owned prior to filing ceases to be property of the estate at confirmation, well, then the debtor can sell that property, encumber that property, give that property away without any requirement of getting bankruptcy court uh, permission. There's no 363 application if it's not property of the estate. So we could have a situation where the debtor puts a second mortgage on the home, takes the proceeds to Las Vegas, has a really good time, and then converts to a Chapter 7 case. And guess what? In that Chapter 7 estate, that lien will be present on the home uh, in full force depriving the creditors of the asset they'd otherwise have. The uh, pending legislation um, bill doesn't really address this it, issue. It does, does not, it? either under the House bill or the Senate bill uh, that are going to conference. Uh, neither, I don't believe, Gene, address this issue at all. They, they don't, they don't change 1306 or 1327 or 348. So, so it's, it, it's, it's a problem that needs to be addressed by the courts. It's unlikely, in my opinion, it'll be addressed satisfactorily or quickly enough in any appellate uh, setting because, uh, as we all know, most Chapter 13 confirmation issues uh, do not get appealed because of the economies of it, uh, so it's unlikely that's going to be the answer. The answer is provide for it in the plan or in the orders of confirmation if you want to preserve the estate. Well, it's um, good to hear, Gene, that, that you have the time on your hands <laughs> to have all these folks come in and deal with these issues. Um, we, uh, we want to move on to um, our next topic, um, which deals with, of course, a very interesting and controversial subject in commercial, or excuse me, consumer um, bankruptcy uh, cases, uh, which, of course, is reaffirmation. Um, Liz, you know, until about, what, two and a half years ago, we all sort of assumed we understood how reaffirmation was supposed to work and, and thought it was working reasonably well. Then came the revelations of what Sears and Federated Department Stores and, and others uh, were doing underneath your radar screens. In, in light of all this controversy um, and all these concerns, uh, what are the courts 
doing now to address reaffirmation problems? Well, during the past two and a half years since the Sears and other problems came to light, there's been a reaction both in the, the judiciary and among the creditor community. Let me talk first about the judicial reaction. The Commission recommended a number of things in the area of reaffirmations. But one of the things that the Commission recommended was that a form, be, form motion uh, for reaffirmation be created, that the Advisory Committee on Bankruptcy Rules do that. And they, they took up the task. And they did, in fact, draft a form reaffirmation agreement, not a motion, uh, which has been issued now, was issued in 1999, as a director's, AO director's form, which means its use is discretionary, not mandatory. And that's a really good form. Uh, for those of you who haven't taken a look at it, I, I commend it to you. Uh, it's quite comprehensive in terms of including the types of information that the debtor should be looking at. Will I have enough money to pay? Is this debt really secured? Have I considered the alternative of redemption? Uh, and so forth. It includes Miranda-type warnings uh, that this agreement, you can voluntarily pay without entering into the agreement. The agreement's not required. Uh, and what the impact of the agreement will be if not rescinded within the time permitted. And finally, it's in plain English, which is always commendable for a legal form and often seems to be quite difficult. There's also been a, a significant increase, I think, in judicial involvement in uh, holding discharge hearings and re reviewing reaffirmation agreements, even when not required by the code. Because, of course, as a result of the 1984 amendments, uh, many of us got out of the business of uh, holding discharge hearings mm -hmm. and reviewing reaffirmation agreements, except in the case of, of pro se debtors. Uh, first, let me make a few preliminary comments on that. Judges differ on whether we have authority to get involved uh, in doing that when it's not a pro se debtor. And there, there's three schools of thought. Uh, there's the school that says, no, the 84 amendments took, it out, took us out of it, except for the pro se debtors. There's the school of thought that says, uh, we have authority to do it. And then there's the school of thought that says, we have authority and the obligation to do it. So it's a continuum. The practices also vary. Uh, some courts are holding discharge hearings for more than just the pro se's. Uh, in fact, uh, Judge David Scholl did a, a survey of all the bankruptcy judges in the country and got about a 90 percent return rate uh, this fall uh, about their reaffirmation and redemption practices. And he found that 22 percent of the judges are holding reaffirmation or discharge hearings for some, at least some debtors who are represented uh, by counsel. Uh, other courts are holding discharge hearings selectively based on some criteria. For instance, if the debt is an unsecured debt that's being reaffirmed, or when the security documents aren't attached to the reaffirmation agreement, so we can't tell if it's really a secured debt. Some courts are reviewing all the reaffirmation agreements, uh, even those with attorney affidavits. Both the District of Montana and Rhode Island have uh, local rules to that effect. And Rhode Island indicates right in its rule what it's looking for, that it's looking to see if the debtors available income based on the Schedule I and J is sufficient to pay the amount being committed to in the reaffirmation agreement. Uh, and if there's not enough income, the court issues an order to show cause why the attorney affidavit shouldn't be stricken. <coughs> uh, some judges are, are in their, their reviews have discovered some real problems with attorney affidavits. And they're using sanctions as a means of getting at those, those problems. Uh, and where they see the problems are uh, in, the ju in the attorney representation of no undue hardship, when you look at the INJ and there's just not enough money to pay, in the failure to advise the debtor regarding alternatives uh, and consequences, and in the failure to investigate whether the creditor's really secured and whether it would really or likely uh, replevy the, the property if, uh, if the reaffirmation agreement's not entered into. And there's uh, a couple of opinions, uh, if you're interested, uh, the Melendez opinions, there's two of them, as well as the Brzee opinion uh, that really discuss this at some length. Uh, and if there's a problem, the court issues an order to show cause using Rule 9011 uh, right. and proceeds to investigate and potentially strike the offending affidavit, thereby, in those courts' view, voiding the reaffirmation agreement, uh, possibly sanctioning the lawyer. Uh, and th doing this, they're systematically improving the quality of practice as well as getting at the individual problem. Well, now that you're paying attention collectively to reaffirmation, of course, 
the uh, creditor industry doesn't always suffer its uh, fate quietly. Has that caused reactive behavior <coughs> in terms, at least in your experience, of seeing an increase in the use of redemption? And do you have the same level of control and authority over a redemption that you do over a reaffirmation? Well, there's no doubt there's been more activity in the last few years in the redemption area than there was before. And part of that probably is directly attributable to what happened in the, the Sears reaffirmation case. Sears, uh, at uh, Judge, Judge Kenner's uh, urging, retained Professor King to review their entire bankruptcy collection practices. Uh, and one of the things he advised Sears to do, and Sears started doing, was filing all the redemption agreements that were entered into. Uh, including those that were, were consensual agreements. Now, of course, Sears took the position that by filing these, they didn't intend for a judge to look at them. They were just <coughs> filing them so that nobody would claim they were making an end run around the, the bankruptcy system. Uh, but once they started doing that, they started showing up on some judges' desks. Uh, and there have now been at least three reported decisions, uh, all involving Sears, as to the issue of whether uh, those redemption agreements must be reviewed by the, the court, uh, and all three have reached the conclusion uh, that they must be, and that, that was the primary issue in those cases. But there's no motion filed. Well, Sears is not filing a motion, just simply filing the reaffirmation. Well, they're correct? finding themselves uh, being ordered to file motions, and in fact, in the, the U.S. trustee region I'm in, in Region 18, which is the five northwestern states, Sears has now entered into a stipulated order that it will file motions accompanying uh, the reaffirmation agreements. The redemption agreements. Excuse me, the redemption agreements. Uh, and will do so until it gives 60 days notice. It's appealing the issue, and I think for right now, it's, it's going to follow the practice of seeing that a motion is, is filed while the issue sorts itself out uh, on appeal. The code itself, uh, 722, doesn't require a motion, correct? Correct, although Rule 6008 says you bring a redemption agreement before the code, before the court by motion. Potentially only if there's a disagreement, though, as to the amount that requires court determination. And I take it that that really is the primary litigable issue, is the appropriate redemption amount. Right. I should say that the Shoal survey tells us that the three reported cases may not reflect the majority practice. Uh, at least 57 percent of the, the judges who reported indicated that they, they don't hold uh, uh, redemption hearings uh, absent some dispute. Right. So th this is an area that I'm not sure what is really the national practice, whether the cases we're seeing is the wave of the future or not. Uh, in terms of value, that really is the one of the major issues. Although the courts are also looking at, is the creditor really secured? Is the property redeemable? But redemption price, uh, of course, Sears argues that post-rash, they get the rash price, the replacement value. But there have now been a series of decisions post-rash that say, no, Sears doesn't. Sears gets what the creditor would realize at a foreclosure sale. Probably the leading case in the area is uh, the Donnelly case from Ohio. Uh, and the rationale goes like this. Uh, Section 722 says that the debtor must pay the allowed secured claim of the creditor. Then you look at 506A to tell you what the allowed secured claim is. And that tells you that you look at value based on the purpose of the valuation and the proposed disposition. And in the case of a redemption, of course, what you're doing is you're buying for cash and the legislative history indicates that redemption is an alternative to foreclosure. Mm -hmm. So you don't have the risks uh, attendant that, that were present in the rash case. As a, a rash expert, David, uh, what do you think? Well, uh, as, as, of course, the author of, of the leading article uh, on rash, I guess I would uh, sort of change your wording, if, if not the result a little bit. I think that, that in redemption uh, that the price is the rash price but that the rash price may not necessarily be replacement value. Uh, but it would seem to me that, that the starting point of any opinion is going to be Section 506 and is going to be then the Supreme Court's interpretation of Section 506. Uh, you know, that's, I think, how you get there. Now, where you wind up at the end of the journey, I think, is a harder call. I think you can make a rash-like argument that since the debtor is retaining the property, that the appropriate value should be the replacement to the debtor. But I think you can also make the argument in the 722 context, unlike the 13 context or the 11 context, the cram down context, that we are here basically 
in a liquidation situation, and, and so that I think there's a much stronger argument for a forced sale or liquidation amount. Uh, does, does it matter, David and Liz, if, if in fact it's not just that creditor who's doing the redemption? There's a growing practice, especially with respect to automobiles, of having third parties come in and finance out the redemption. That is to say, they will pay, they will lend to the debtor an amount necessary to redeem the property from the pre-petition creditor. Um, and a lot of that practice is based on the notion that they can get a cheap price. They can get the liquidation price. But it seems to me that if you go to 506, as you say, and you take a look at what the use is, I mean, it's not really a liquidation. This is a human being who's getting a fresh start. Part of the fresh start is they need a car or they need something that they're redeeming. And that, in that case, it, you, kind of, you kind of get a contradictory result. I mean, you want, you want a low price because you want them to finance it out, but you probably want a replacement price because that's exactly what they're going to use it for. Yeah, and it seems to me that part of what's happening here, and it's really a, a tremendously interesting point I think that Liz is making, is that uh, an industry reaction to the constraints on reaffirmation is an increased use in redemption. And when you couple that, Bruce, with what you're talking about is, is a redemption that is in essence fueled by uh, some sort of third-party loan, so it's truly a redemption based on periodic payments. Right. What's happened is, is that the industry has now created sort of a practice model that's very different from any model that Congress had in mind, and it seems to me that it puts the three of y'all uh, and the other people on the bench in a very awkward position in that you're now dealing with a an industry practice uh, that really wasn't contemplated by Congress at and, all. And in, if, assuming I have the authority to look at redemptions, even without uh, any objection or dispute, do I then reach into that redemption and look at the terms of the financing and say what interest rate is being paid, uh, what term is it, et cetera? And overrule an agreed upon amount between the creditor and the debtor. And the debtor. Uh, a question I had for those judges who think they have the power is, what's the time limit for the redemption agreement? Mm -hmm. When does that motion have to be filed? To, to engage in this practice requires making up a lot of rules that simply aren't in the code and or in the bankruptcy what if the debtor rules. doesn't pay the redemption Exactly. Amount. Right. You know, one of the problems I see happening is <clears throat> the pending legislation is going to require that there be only the three choices that are set out in 521-2. You either have to surrender the property, enter into a reaffirmation, or redeem. Those are the only choices that would exist under the proposed legislation. Now, if that's the case, the debtor says, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, reaffirm, but then they don't have enough money. There's not enough surplus income shown in Schedules I and J to allow for the redemption, or allow for the reaffirmation. Then what happens? Well, they can agree to redeem. What if they don't have enough money to redeem? Do they have to give back the property? Or can they enter into an agreement with the creditor to maybe make their redemption payments in installments over time? Well, that's Bruce's point, isn't it? I think most of the cases out there say the pre-petition creditor can't, cannot finance the redemption because that would be an installment redemption, right? But nothing is nothing stopping stops an outside, credit outside credit lender from, from saying, uh, and in fact, you might want to say that that's a practice that makes sense if, in fact, you're going to sit down as a policy matter, that, in fact, if someone is willing uh, to take out an, an existing creditor for cash at a price that Congress has set in 506, what's wrong with that? Well, why, I mean, you know why? the person's going to have to take, the person's going to have to have a car. They're going to have to get it some way. Why then couldn't the original lender simply be the redeeming lender? You know, I'm going to not new take loan. installment payments, but I'm making a new loan mm -hmm. to the debtor on new terms. Would you approve of that? I, that that's very questionable. Would you, know, you ever but, find out about? But how, how would I know but about? How, really, how is that going to end up being different than a reaffirmation at it, on different terms in the original loan? The the problem is that there's not an essential difference between right, redemption right. and reaffirmation, and we have totally different uh, legal frameworks, different sets of rules, but the economic result is very similar. Well, let, let's talk briefly about uh, ride-through or retention or fourth option, depending on which of the, the uh, nicknames you like. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1984 amendments, of course, brought us Section 520, 21-2, uh, which required that a, a Chapter 7 debtor with consumer secured debts had to file a statement of intention. As Jean indicated, uh, that statement of intention has to indicate whether the debtor will surrender or retain the property, and if applicable, whether the debtor will reaffirm, uh, redeem, 
uh, or avoid the lien because the property is exempt mm -hmm. and it's avoidable. And the issue is whether the debtor who wants to retain collateral uh, can uh, just retain it without re reaffirming and redeeming if the debtor is current. And we currently have an even split in the circuits, a third, a third, a third. One third say uh, yes, uh, that they, you have to either redeem or reaffirm. Uh, one third say no, you, you can retain. The, the options are not exclusive. They look to uh, some legislative history that indicates the intent was to provide notice to the secured creditors what was going to happen to their collaterals so they didn't have to sit around wondering. But it's interesting in those circuits that say no, there's actually a split in the reasoning and it's two and two. Uh, two of the courts, circuit courts, the second uh, and the tenth circuit indicate that the bankruptcy court has the discretion to uh, enjoin or stop the, uh, the foreclosure uh, even though there hasn't been a reaffirmation or redemption. The other two take a much more bright line test. They simply say those bankruptcy ipso facto clauses that you would use uh, if the, the debt is current simply aren't enforceable. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting departure in, in reasoning. Of course, I, we recognize that if the legislation is adopted, it's going to be somewhat ap academic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but uh, one of the impacts of that legislation is I think we're going to see a real increase in our reaffirmation uh, business. The, the Creighton study, uh, phase one's been finished, and I saw the, the article that's going to come out in the American Bankruptcy Journal in the next issue uh, that deals with their findings. And they found that with respect to vehicle loans, which are probably the, the largest impact of this ride through is on vehicle loans, that uh, in the two districts they compared where there was ride through, the two districts where there was not ride through, there were eight times more vehicle loans reaffirmed where there's uh, no ride through. So we may see, be seeing a very substantial uh, increase in our reaffirmation uh, business. Well, that's what bothers me about the elimination of ride-through is that I think it's going to increase the rate of what I would call, in effect, involuntary reaffirmation. You know, from the creditor's point of view, I've never quite understood this because it seems to me I really don't want surrender of that collateral and I'm far more likely to be better off by allowing the debtor to continue the installment, the periodic payments, as long as my in rem claim is in, in place. The, so the I don't really do want that. It? Uh, the problem is how do you enforce it? If the debtor fails to make a payment, can the creditor send a notice to the debtor saying, please pay, you missed a payment, or is that a violation of the discharge injunction? Concerns like that, as I understand it, have led a number of auto lenders to abandon the, the ride-through proposal for fear that if they do engage in that practice, they'll be found to have violated the discharge injunction when the debtor fails to pay. Yeah, there's, there's practical problems on the flip side. When the debtor takes advantage of the ride-through, they want to get their payment coupon book, they want to get the reminder <laughs> yeah. notice, yeah. and they're very unhappy when the creditor says, sorry, can't talk to you uh, because of your bankruptcy discharge. So yeah. there's problems on both sides. Well, time is, time is running short on us, but, but Liz, let me um, ask you to close by talking a little bit about um, the reaffirmation provisions in the, uh, in the pending bills, and, and of course, um, they are different. Are, are those going to solve all our problems in reaffirmation? Oh, I <laughs> wish they would solve all our problems in reaffirmation. I'm not, not sure it, they're going to make much difference. Uh, the House bill is, is, has a fairly minor change where now there would be an additional required disclosure uh, in the event the reaffirmation involved wholly unsecured uh, debt. And the disclosure would be that the debtor uh, was required to, f to attend a discharge hearing unless that right was waived with an attorney's uh, certification. So I expect it would just be an amendment to the attorney's certification <coughs> in most of the cases. The Senate version, uh, which started out the same as the House but was amended uh, by the Reed Sessions uh, Amendment, uh, of course uh, makes some more substantial changes. Uh, there are changes in the required disclosures. Uh, there's going to be more disclosure about the underlying credit arrangement. Uh, but I have to say, there's going to be a, a, uh, a dictate that the, uh, the forms we use, there's more detail in the statute. But I don't like the form that's in the legislation as well as I like the B-240 <laughs> in one important respect. And that is, under the forms in the Senate bill, you can't tell how long it takes to pay back the debt. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize that's a problem with open-ended credit. 
But you could certainly say, based upon the current interest rate, if it doesn't change, it will take you 73 <coughs> months at $12 mm -hmm. a month. And that seems like a very important piece of information to anybody who's making this decision. Uh, and finally, there'll be a rebuttable presumption of undue hardship if the debtor's schedules indicate uh, that the debtor couldn't afford to pay. So uh, there may be some, some downside to this if it, it has an impact that maybe uh, the argument's been made that courts won't have as much control because there's greater detail in the, the statute. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with the critics on that. One step forward, two steps back. <coughs> Right. Well, we want to uh, turn to another, our, our final consumer topic for this program, which is the uh, nettlesome issue of um, entirety's property. Um, Gene, you look at the code and, and you think it should be easy. 522B2B mm -hmm. suggests mm -hmm. that a uh, debtor may exempt from administration in the bankruptcy case tenancy by the entirety's property to the extent it's immune from execution under. Um, state law. Right. Fairly straightforward. About half the states, I understand from your materials, recognize that form of property ownership uh, for married couples. Um, what are uh, some of the problems that have arisen with TB property uh, under the code? Why has it become such an important issue? Well, the problem with TBE is that it provides the potential for an unlimited exemption in property. Some states allow all forms of property to be owned uh, as tenancy by the entireties by a married couple. And if the state were to say that creditors can't touch the entireties property, then under 522B2B, that property would be exempt under the bankruptcy code. There's a lot of controversy about unlimited homestead exemptions in Texas and Florida, but here we have a potentially unlimited exemption going beyond homestead in 22 states. And what's interesting is that that's a problem that can come up for any bankruptcy judge. Even a bankruptcy judge in California, which doesn't recognize tenancy by the entireties, may have to deal with property that's owned by a debtor in a state that does recognize tenancy by the entireties. So, for example, California bankruptcy courts have had to deal with entireties problems arising out of Hawaii property. That's and the Cataldo case, exactly. isn't it? A $2 million um, home. Exactly. And so this is a big problem for potentially any bankruptcy judge in the country. To understand it, you have to take a couple steps back. Tenancy by the entireties was a feature of the common law, and it applied to married couples. The idea was a married couple was one person, and that person was the husband. The husband made all decisions for the marital entity involving the property. The wife's personal property was considered to be an absolute gift to her husband when they got married, and her real property entered into this entirety relationship. And the idea was that the marital entity's real property would be controlled by the husband during his lifetime. He would make all decisions regarding its use, and he would decide uh, to what extent it should be encumbered by any credit. The creditors could take action against his right to the use of the property during his lifetime, and they could attach his right to get the property in the event that his wife predeceased him. The only thing that they couldn't get, the only thing they couldn't get, was the wife's survivorship interest. If she managed to live longer than her husband, she would get the property free and clear of any claims against him only. The only way that the husband could transfer the entire fee of the property is if he got his wife's consent, if there was a joint transfer. And similarly, the only creditors who could get at the fee of the property were creditors who had claims against both the husband and the wife. So that was the common law. And that situation lasted until about the mid-1800s, when states started to say that this wasn't quite fair to women. So they enacted married women's property laws, which said that wives could hold property in their own names. And that, in turn, led to judicial problems. How do we interpret ownership of property after the married women's property laws change the common law? And the courts basically came up with three approaches. One was to say, entireties no longer exist. We don't have ownership by the entireties anymore. That estate is abolished. Another was to say, we're going to treat the couple equally. The husband and wife are both going to be treated alike, and they're going to have the rights of a husband under the common law. And according to that approach, either party could convey the value of the property during the marriage, and either could use their own survivorship interest as a basis for 
uh, financing, and the creditors of either individually could attach those interests. That's if both parties were recognized as having the rights of the husband. Well, another way to treat the couple equally was to say that each had the disabilities of the wife under the common law. And then neither could convey anything, and no creditor could attach anything unless the creditor had a claim against both. So that's the situation that we bring into 522b2b of the bankruptcy code. And I take it as a situation, as you said, that every bankruptcy judge potentially faces. That's exactly right. And so what happens under the code? Well, in contrast to what happened under the Act, it's uniformly recognized that the interest of an individual debtor as a tenant by the entirety becomes property of the estate. 541A is so broad that it certainly sweeps that in. But then the question becomes, to what extent can that property interest be exempted? Well, it depends. It depends first on whether there are any joint claims against the husband and wife, even though only one of them is in bankruptcy. Because to the extent that there are joint claims, no matter what recognition of tenancy by the entireties exists, those joint claims aren't exempt. They're not exempt or immune from process under state law, so the property is not exempt to the extent of the joint claim. Now, even if there aren't joint claims, even if there's only individual claims, there still may be a failure of exemption. Because remember, in the states that say that tenancy by the entireties continues to exist, if they recognize each of the married parties as having the rights of a husband under the common law, then even an individual creditor could glom onto, if you will, the survivorship interest of the individual debtor. The contingent, right? Right. right. So, so that's a non-exempt asset in the bankruptcy estate. So. A bankruptcy trustee could theoretically assert that there is non-exempt property. And then we get to another feature of the code, section 363H. If there's property held jointly and the estate can sell the property and get a greater return than trying to sell the individual debtor's interest in the property, then if that benefit to the estate outweighs the detriment to the non-debtor party, the property can be sold as a unit, the state takes its share and gives to the non-debtor spouse the other share. And that's where the litigations come up in this area. What it uh, means is that trustees dealing with the tenancy by the entirety's property have to go through a number of steps in properly administering an estate. They have to find out if the property really is held in tenancy by the entirety. They have to find out what kind of an exemption is claimed. They very well may have to file an objection to the exemption claim. So they're going to have to do all of this in a timely fashion. You, uh, <laughs> uh, that there's this real risk that they're going to run into the 522 time problem. Right. Taylor versus Freeland and Kranz is a real potential obstacle for trustees here. A uh, very short time after the conclusion of the first meeting of creditors in which to make that decision to object or not, and a failure to object may have the consequence of barring any right the estate may have to the tenancy by the entirety's property. Does it make any difference what value the debtor in schedules claimed as being exempt when in fact perhaps more? or less, rather, was exempt. Well, you know, in the aftermath of Taylor versus Freeland and Kranz, the courts have gotten creative. Uh, one uh, opinion uh, in particular, uh, Williams versus Pate, a Fourth Circuit decision, has said that if the debtor claims, say, the full value of the tenancy by the entirety's property as exempt, but cites a provision of law dealing with tenancy by the entireties, then the Fourth Circuit says you've got to read what the debtor claimed in light of the statute that was cited. And if the statute would only allow the property to be exempt to the extent of individual claims, well, then that's what the debtor is really claiming. Uh, and so there can be ways of getting around Taylor versus Freeland and Crown. Similarly, if the debtor puts down a value, it might be said that we're not objecting to the exemption, we're only objecting to the value that's claimed by the debtor. And so there are ways that uh, that can be done. But certainly the safer course of action for any trustee uh, where there's a tenancy by the entirety's claim in the face of joint claims or in the face of individual claims that would be recognized against the debtor's contingent interest, it would be wise to file that objection in a timely fashion. And, and of course, the valuation issues are real easy here, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I, I did want to ask you about that because that, of course, comes up in Chapter 13 if you're in a state where a creditor can end up with a lien on the, uh, an individual creditor can end up with a lien on the tenancy by the entirety interest. 
How do you think you go about valuing what that interest is worth? Well, you know, this is a real problem for any judge uh, because theoretically the value depends on a number of actuarial computations. What's a survivorship interest worth? Well, the survivorship interest has value only if the debtor survives the spouse. So you have to calculate what the odds are of the debtor surviving the spouse. And then you have to figure, well, how long is that going to take? Because you want to reduce the value at the time of the spouse's death to present value. That's a complication, but there's even more of a complication because the tenancy by the entirety can only continue to exist during the term of the marriage. So divorce becomes a factor as well, and divorce has a different consequence. Instead of vesting the entire property in the surviving spouse, it would split the value of the property at the time of the divorce. So the valuation problems are extraordinarily complex, and we certainly need, could use an expert witness. You need to value for purposes of the best interest test? in Chapter 13 and maybe disposable income if there is an objection. Sure, and even more simply, in a, in a run-of-the-mill Chapter 7 case, if the court were persuaded that a 363H sale should take place, you've got to decide what portion of the sale proceeds go to the estate and what portion would go to the non-debtor spouse. And so the very computations that we're talking about could come up in any circumstance like that. Let's assume we solve that problem and we've mm -hmm. determined what portion goes to the non-debtor spouse and what portion goes to the estate. Presumably the reason the trustee was able to partition was there were joint creditors against whom the property was not exempt. That's the major reason. All right. Now the trustee and the estate have their proper share of the proceeds. Who gets them? Just the joint creditors whose status facilitated the partition or all of the unsecured creditors? Well, the courts take two very different approaches on this question. I would say most of the reported cases take the position that the money ought to go to the joint creditors whose claims resulted in the failure of the exemption in the first place. Most of the reported cases say that. And their rationale is you're not going to allow these creditors to be treated worse in the bankruptcy than they would be treated under state law. And they cite the Butner case of the Supreme Court as support for the proposition that state law property rights should be recognized unless there's a competing bankruptcy issue of substantial importance. Well, the counter to that, and I have to confess I'm, I'm one of the contrarians here, is that the bankruptcy code does have a policy. It's a policy of equality of distribution. Uh, the bankruptcy code itself sets up only two classes of property, as far as I can tell, exempt property and non-exempt property. The exempt property is given to the debtor. The non-exempt property comes into the estate. It's supposed to be liquidated by a trustee and then distributed. And the bankruptcy code itself sets out the priority of distribution in Section 726. That's the competing bankruptcy policy. There's no provision in the code that says, contrary to Section 726, we're going to carve out a special class of joint creditors and pay them the full process proceeds of this non-exempt property. So on that basis, I'd go with the minority of the reported uh, opinion. Under that approach, Gene, if, if, if the only one spouse was in a debtor in bankruptcy and, and you nevertheless have joint creditors and the money is distributed, the estate's money is distributed to all the, the Chapter 7 creditors, then the non-bankruptcy spouse is left with still some joint creditor claims, correct? Potentially. Potentially. That's correct. That is correct. And that is a different result than would happen under non-bankruptcy law. But, of course, the position that I take is that the bankruptcy code in general provides a different distribution than what would be provided under non-bankruptcy law, and that's why we have a code. So it, it is a different outcome, uh, but it's one that I think the code uh, requires. And, and what's more, you've got a situation of ease of administration, too. You can have extraordinarily complicated distribution schemes uh, if you don't have uh, a general distribution of the non-exempt assets. Let's take a state, for example, where we do have uh, the possibility of attaching the survivorship interest of an individual creditor. Now we've got to sell this property and make a distinction between that part which is attributable to the contingent interest, that part which is attributable to the joint claims, and pay them out in a differential way. It becomes extraordinarily complicated, even more than what we were talking about earlier. If you don't do that, right, in a case where, in an appropriate case, you might have a case where a separate creditor has more, has 
a greater incentive to make sure that they get into bankruptcy because you're giving them something in bankruptcy that they wouldn't have outside. That's exactly right. And if you look back at this parallel situation that many of the minority decisions have cited, Moore versus Bay, you have exactly that right. situation. Moore versus Bay is a situation where all of the creditors share in the recovery of a fraudulent conveyance, where under the applicable law. state law, only those creditors who had claims prior to the conveyance would be able to pursue a fraudulent conveyance action. So in bankruptcy, those pre-transfer creditors get less, right. the post-transfer uh, transfer creditors get something they never would have gotten under non-bankruptcy law. So they have the incentive to, to commence the bankruptcy. So I if you take a step back, if you take the contrarian view, are you just saying that state property law really has no business making these kinds of distinctions between separate and joint creditors? The state gets to decide what's exempt and what's non-exempt. The bankruptcy code makes that clear. But once it's non-exempt, the state can't determine what the priority of distribution should be. I think that's the distinction the code makes. So Gene, you've, you've brought out all these complications. I guess that's why we as bankruptcy judges don't see more sales in bankruptcy of tenancy by entirety. <laughs> Everyone is frightened off of that. Well, that may be, uh, but you know what I think is going on is that the trustees don't have an understanding of the complexity of this area. If they did, we might see a lot more of these problems coming up because the trustees might be objecting to exemptions that they're not objecting to now and uh, finding funds that they could distribute. Well, we're running a little low on time, but let me ask you another question. Suppose we have entireties property, which is not itself exempt as mm -hmm. a homestead and the non-debtor spouse dies mm. before the administration is closed. Right? Does his or her undivided one-half interest go into their testamentary estate or is now the bankruptcy debtor vested with full ownership of the property? Well, you know, that's a question I haven't particularly looked at, but my hunch is that because exemptions are measured as of the filing of the case, that a post-filing death of a spouse would not affect the debtor's right to claim the exemption. But uh, I'd have to e have to do some reading on e that e one. Except that property of the estate includes uh, inheritance that the, the, the debtor gets within 80 180 days. days. So I guess you want your spouse to, to live, live beyond at least that. six months. Yeah. Six months. Well, yeah. there's another there's another way to look at that too, Larry. Now that I think of it, you could say that the estate always had the contingent survivorship right. interest, right. and if you're in that sort of estate, the survivorship interest just it's became vested. a lot more valuable during the course of the administration of the case. But it still belongs to the estate. So but like practically, you talked about vesting earlier. <laughs> <laughs> practically speaking, we go back to the Taylor, Freeland, and Crohn's problem. Right. If the trustee has not objected timely. They're asleep. It is what it is. It is, it is right. what it is. So the rule again is trustees object. Yeah, there's a recent case in the middle districts of Florida, Tharp, or Tharp, that takes exactly that position, Bill, that the uh, once the non-debtor spouse dies, uh, the tenancy is dis dissolved and the interest of the deceased spouse is simply extinguished. Mm -hmm. So that's one in which um, the debtor lost not only his spouse, but half the value of So the trustee's uh, objection property. might need to say, I'm objecting because there may be a death. That's right. right. You'd be right. Even exactly. if there's no joint creditors, there Obje may be the like trustee that. to object. <laughs> well, that's it for the first part of our uh, program. Uh, I want to thank our panelists again for coming in with a very lively discussion to help us explore and explain these topics. Um, be sure to watch part two of the program when Professors Markell and Epstein We'll be taking a look at the state of the new value exception after the Supreme Court's controversial decision in 203 North LaSalle and some perhaps incorrect assumptions about assumption and assignment. And remember, we will be talking with congressional staffer Joseph Rubin about the status of the bankruptcy reform bill that's presently being worked on uh, on the Hill. Will there be a final bill? What will it look like? How will it change the nature of our work? Is there anything left yet that we might still do to kill it? Until then, <laughs> for the Federal Judicial Television Network, I'm Lawrence Ponaroff saying thanks for watching. <laughs>